Letters have been at the center of our Christian faith since the first century. 21 of our 27 New Testament books are letters. In recent weeks, two letters have rocked our world as a faith community, the letter of resignation from Kevin Jones and the letter ending her called ministry at First Church from Reverend Emily Krauss Corzine. Four additional letters have been written to me calling for my resignation, and at least 12 letters have come to me and others supporting my ministry. You see, letters are everywhere. Letters carry us into our deepest convictions of faith. They clarify who we are and what we believe about ourselves and others. They speak from the heart of one person to another. In my 22 and a half years with you, I've written many letters to you and for you. For many years, you received a weekly pastoral epistle from me. In addition, all of my 22 senior minister annual reports have been written as a letter to the congregation. And I've even preached a few sermons which have been a letter to you. Today, I offer you a letter. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, grace and peace to you in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. I write with a heart full of love and yet a broken heart, one that's broken in two. The news of our music minister and our associate minister leaving us, news that came only five days apart, has left me and all of us reeling. I have described it as two torpedoes <clears throat> blasted into the hull of First Church's ship. I did not ask for them to leave. I do not wish for them to leave. We are all lessened as a community of faith without Kevin and Emily here. I am quite sad as I work to respond and stabilize our remaining staff and our faith community and to work together to plan the future in light of these two significant departures. As I write, I can't help but look back over the past 26 months. We survived the worst pandemic, but it appears that the cost of our survival has been greater than we imagined. We are not alone in this cost. As you know, March 2022 marked the worst month in American history for people resigning from their jobs. Over the course of the pandemic, this exodus from the workforce has been labeled the great resignation. We thought we were immune, but we have discovered that we are susceptible to such loss in our faith community. In addition to Emily and Kevin, our building, building and grounds assistant superintendent, Daryl Cross left for higher pay at the end of March, and we continue preparing for our building and grounds superintendent, Mark Denke's retirement in the autumn of 2023. While the pandemic surely exacerbated our difficulties, the seeds of some of our challenges were planted before COVID hit us. So here we are. We have come through a lot, and we have done it together. As we have said for 16 months, when you were not in this room and we were here, we are separate, but we're together. Those of us who have survived COVID so far must continue to find a way forward together as Jesus says in Matthew 19, 6, what God has joined together, let no one tear apart. COVID has brought suffering and struggle to each and every one of our lives over the past 26 months. It has been tough for all of us, no matter how we frame it. In March 2020, we all began to confront a culture of death. We felt this pain immediately at First Church, Within weeks of the pandemic's arrival, Dana McCrary lost her sister, Gina Harris, in just 48 hours to COVID. Dr. Carl Dannenberger became the first person at OSU Medical Center with COVID 
and came close to death as he battled for his life on a ventilator for three weeks and also became the first person to survive COVID at OSU. Over the past two years, at least eight members have died with COVID-related cause, including my friend, mentor, and colleague, Reverend Herb Getz. Most of us have lost friends, co-workers, neighbors, family in this devastation and this pandemic. More than 60% of us have tested positive for COVID. Some of us still have lasting effects that sting and linger still. Remember that by Memorial Day 2020, two months into the pandemic, our nation had lost 100,000 people. This week, we passed 1 million deaths from COVID in the United States, and worldwide, the number is more than 6.27 million people. Public health experts are saying that the true number of deaths could easily triple what we have counted. Going back to March 2020, something else died for me, just like something else died for you. For me, my old way of being a pastor died. The scriptures and stories of resilience guided my prayer and shifted my ministerial leadership path, together with a phenomenal staff, and with Peter Murray as our lead live stream minister, we moved into being a virtual church. We worked together through the steps of becoming a seeming studio in worship and teaching and visitation in every other way. The weekly worship team was sensational, and we gave you our best Sunday by Sunday from March 15, 2020 through this current moment via cameras and technology. I became more adept at doing adult study, confirmation, and media's via, media via Zoom, although, as some of you know, I still forget to unmute when I talk. <laughs> and seeing you as our Zoom land students and leaders, as if you were all contestant on, contestants on Hollywood Squares or in the opening credits of the Brady Bunch. Like many of my colleagues, I consistently broke the Tenth Commandment, which you all know coveted, and I coveted the remarkable online abilities of other congregations, pastors, and rabbis. I call it COVID coveting. Beyond the gain of this new normal, something was terribly lost for me. I am a pastor. I am relational. I lead with my heart and my soul and my mind. Through it all, I could not visit hospitals and nursing homes retirement communities, and your homes. I couldn't see you for meals at restaurants. Weddings stopped almost completely. Brides and grooms were kept apart, not held together. And when your loved ones died, I was on the phone and on Zoom and on FaceTime with you, but not with your family, holding your hands and praying with you side by side. Funerals were done on Zoom or live stream. As your pastor, I felt completely cut off, and I had to figure out how to keep connecting with 1,500-plus men, women, teens, and children, praying to God each and every day for each and every one of you was my only salvation. Through prayer, I lived into hope. As your chief of staff, I felt cut off as well. We moved to Zoom meetings and virtual communication. There were weeks and months which moved into years in some cases when we literally didn't see each other face to face or eye to eye. For heaven's sakes, we were out of this room for 16 months. I didn't see any of you then, although you saw us here. As one who doesn't use social media, and please don't rub it in, I texted a lot just simply to reach out and stay connected to you. It was my main way to stay connected, and for those of you who got too many, I ask your forgiveness. For me, this time was even more intense because of my wife Susan's immune-compromised condition and her vulnerability and susceptibility to illness unto death. There were times during the pandemic when I moved into the church for four or five days at a time and lived in my office because I had been exposed to COVID in the role of your pastor, an essential worker, and couldn't and wouldn't risk the devastating effects for my wife. Some people questioned this. Others criticized me for it, accusing me of crossing boundaries. But most of you who heard this were understanding and kind. 
because you also had family members facing similar difficult choices in the workforce who were caring for their loved ones too. And like some of you who brought new life into this world, I had two grandchildren, Emeryn and Axel, born in Ohio during the pandemic. I saw Emeryn through a sliding glass door off her back porch late at night when she was first born, and then I didn't hold her in my arms for three months. It would be weeks before I saw Axel face to face, and we hardly saw and rarely held them during the height of the pandemic, which hurt me deeply. Cut off from you, often from loved ones and isolated in ways that none of us ever expected before, I worked hard to keep you safe, to keep the staff safe, to keep Susan safe and alive, and find new ways to minister and persevere through the pandemic. There were many days and weeks in this desert of isolation that I felt like I was failing you and falling far short of giving you my all. On that day, but nothing matched my lowest point in ministry, December 12, 2021. On that day, following worship, I heard that the three ministerial staff with whom I had ventured through the pandemic in leadership of worship and so much more over so many years had shared serious verbal concerns about me with key lay leaders. Never in my 37 years of ordained ministry has any staff person registered such concerns about me or shared such complaints to lay leaders about my leadership or management style. It cut me to the heart. In January, an independent attorney was brought in and investigated what happened. She, was finally, she finally met with me, having met with the others, and she said three times in the course of our Zoom conversation, she found nothing of substance in her investigation. She recommended that all four of us work on and improve communication and our relationships. Although I have never seen her report, I agreed to move forward wholeheartedly. For the past four months, I've asked for this to happen. Although our lay leaders have been working hard to bring this about, the two letters of resignation came just the week before we were supposed to all sit down and, in the words of Psalm 51, 7, reason together with one another. My heart is broken by this. Something I have heard in recent weeks concerns, concerns my pattern of behavior. In my 37 years of ordained ministry, as a child of two uh, oldest children of ministers, and from a family of generations of ministers, I have only served as a pastor. I have served three congregations in the United Church of Christ, my birthright denomination, all in Ohio, Bethany and Cleveland from 85 to 89, North Congregational in Columbus from March 89 through January 2000, and First Church since January 23, 2000. As a pastor and teacher, I have demonstrated one consistent pattern of behavior. I have loved and served each congregation and all our members and friends with everything I have. Right or wrong, I have always done what I believed was in the best interest of each congregation. In each congregation, our members set forth the vision. Together, we have worked through a series of long-range plans over the years for a flourishing of faith. Each church's membership has grown in each year of my 37 years of service. Here at First Church, you expect your pastor to lead in the work of social justice. It's in my job description. I have done my best to do this. I have been a founding pastor of Bread, the founder of We Believe Ohio, which brought together 380 religious leaders from across the state to combat the hate of the religious right in Ohio. I was co-founder of the Area Religious Coalition, which worked for justice both within the Department of Police and the community. And I helped establish Faith in Public Life Ohio with Reverend Dan Clark doing all the heavy lifting. And thanks to the generosity of Nancy Jeffrey and the Jeffrey family, and the investments from our community by people who trust that First Church is in fact a community believing in justice, we built the Washington Gladden Social Justice Park, the only social justice park in America. Twenty years ago, we worked together to become an open and affirming congregation, only the second such congregation in central Ohio, the first of which was my previous congregation, North Church. 
I have been the only white contributing editor for the Columbus Dayton African American News Journal for the past 11 years, although two others have joined the contributing editor staff in the last year. According to Dr. Amy Jill Levine, I co-led with Reverend Misha Zinko the largest interfaith Bible study in the country with over 250 Christians and Jews. Then we followed that with over 350 people who participated in Speaking of Faith, the largest group ever to assemble for learning about other faiths in the history of Ohio. Thanks to 53 Geniuses of Justice, I have now completed the book, The Genius of Justice. We have grown our congregation from 750 adults and children in 2000 to 1,500 plus adults and children in 2022, while five other of the 11 downtown churches have closed during the same years. We also did this during the time when our denomination lost 30% of its membership nationwide. Thanks to your generosity and your vision, our pledge base has grown from a little over 200,000 to close to a million dollars. Thanks to our endowments handled so faithfully and well by the trustees, our church's investments have grown while other churches have eaten up theirs to keep their doors open. But best of all, along with great co-teachers across the years, one's right here, it has been my honor to teach 315 confirmands, scripture and study and the Christian faith, and they have made their choices about life and faith moving forward in holy boldness, no matter what their choice was. This has been my pattern of behavior. I have been a pastor who has grown churches in the United Church of Christ. I have taught, I have preached, I have prophesied deliverance, and I've tried to live the gospel of Jesus Christ while witnessing for justice and peace as an Ohio interfaith leader. This church and our community and our world need us to work together in the fight for justice and peace, our division sends a signal to the world that even the church will kill each other off in difficult times. We can do better than that. We can love one another. What shall we say to all this? As I write, I am aware that our faith in Jesus Christ always calls us deeper and always calls us forward. We are actually called by God to be in the right place. I draw this from Father Greg Boyle of Creighton University writing on the Beatitudes. Father Boyle says, Scripture scholars say that the more exact translation of the word Beatitude, if you were to really say it precisely, although it's a little awkward, that's his words, wouldn't be blessed and wouldn't be happy. It would be, you're in the right place. In other words, you are in the right place when you are poor in spirit, you are in the right place when you mourn. You are in the right place as you are meek, meek like Jesus and Moses. You are in the right place if you hunger and thirst for justice and righteousness. You are in the right place if you are merciful. You are in the right place if you are pure in heart. You are in the right place if you are a peacemaker. And when people persecute you or insult you or utter all kinds of lies about you because of your faith in Jesus, you're in the right place. The Beatitudes are about social location. They're about where we choose to stand and with whom we choose to stand. They show us how to stand in the right place, which really matters. I believe the Beatitudes are not simply a guide for spirituality, they are a geography of faith. In closing, I circle back to Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. This church was a doozy. Paul really struggled with this church. They were difficult people who specialized in division. On any number of occasions, Paul intervenes to teach them how to be Christians, how to work together, how to remember that they are Christ's church and serve God and their neighbors in need, not their cliques or special interests. They are the body of Christ, not a, partisan, not a party of partisans. By the time we reach Corinthians 13, Paul is exasperated and exhausted in his struggle to hold this divided cluster of Christians together. It is at this point that grace overcomes him, that he delivers the most beautiful and powerful words he ever wrote. He calls them to live and to love. 
He wants them to move into and through their conflict to get to a better place. He calls them to be a healed community. And in the end, it is about the whole community and making the community whole. Listen again to a few of his words. If I speak in the tongues of humans and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It keeps no record of wrongs, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. And now faith, hope, and love remain, he finally says, these three, and the greatest of these is love. In spite of any of our differences, and no matter what we hang on to, I pray with my whole heart that love known to us in God will deliver us through this current moment. Everything else will come to an end. Only one thing survives. It is love. God's love will never end. May you be blessed, or rather, may you be in the right place. My brothers and sisters in Christ, may God always bless you and keep you and love you with all my love and blessings. Timothy.